Welcome to Banfield. The final chapter in the Brian Laundry investigation is still being written, and much of the content is going to come from the evidence that's discovered in the Florida Nature Reserve, where Brian Laundry's decomposed body was found. <clears throat> so far, the initial autopsy results are inconclusive. That means they don't know how he died or what eventually actually killed him. And the forensic anthropologist tasked with that job may not be able to find out either. The attorney for Brian's parents, Stephen Bertolino, tells us that when the examination is over, Brian's remains will be cremated. He added there will be no funeral. But that's really all his parents are saying. Because Chris and Roberta Laundrie have left their Northport home for an unknown location to reportedly grieve privately. I'm joined by Brian Enton, who is live with us now in Florida. So, Brian, where are the laundries? Oh, that's a good question, Ashley. We don't know. Uh, what I can tell you is over the weekend, Chris Laundry came outside the house and put these no trespassing signs in the front yard. Uh, the minute I saw him doing that, I thought to myself, I think he might be planning to leave. And that's exactly what happened uh, yesterday morning around 9 a.m., uh, he put some boxes into the truck ahead of time. Uh, Roberta had a backpack. They got into the red truck uh, and they left. The only thing Steve Bertolino, uh, the laundry's attorney, will tell us is that they are somewhere in Florida right now grieving uh, the loss of their son. I think a lot of people were really wondering after the news, you know, broke that he was indeed dead, that they'd identified those uh, remains as his. If people would just sort of back away and, and, and leave the little yellow bungalow alone. Um, but he saw the need to put up the no trespassing signs. Why is that? Well, there have still been people in the area uh, visiting the house, shouting. Uh, some new signs have gone up. Um, it hasn't really quieted down much uh, on the street, at least over the weekend and on Friday. Uh, today, we were in Northport. It was definitely quieter. I think people realized that the laundries were now gone, so there was really no point uh, for them to be outside the house. But, but overall, I would say um, the developments at the end of last week really did not tone things down outside the laundry house. So are you surprised at the announcement that uh, there will be no funeral uh, for Brian Laundry, or is that even true? Maybe there will be one. It just won't involve any publicity. Yeah, it's possible that Bertolino is just telling us no funeral and they might have a small memorial service. He said that Brian will be cremated. Uh, we know that, you know, all that's left of his remains right now, it's skeletal remains. Uh, no, it didn't really surprise me, Ashley, just because, I mean, they have such a hard time even leaving their house without people getting upset that I think it would be difficult for them, obviously, to have a funeral. And perhaps that's sort of what they're doing right now somewhere, uh, gathering as a family and, you know, having that moment right now. Yeah. So uh, here's something that um, I, I found astounding. Uh, I know that that people are talking about a, a TikToker who found a water bottle uh, in the reserve and has turned it over to the police and that the TikToker has matched it with the water bottle found in uh, in Gabby's truck in the van. But what I mean, first of all, seriously, is this actually possible? And here's the video. She, she sees it. She takes a picture of it. Um, it's a pretty unique little pattern on it, so that would be something that would be unique and memorable. But my question is, the medical examiner came out there. I take a look on the left over there. Can you see that water bottle? It's kind of it's partly off your screen there. Can you see that water bottle? Just, just off the left, we circled it in red, same pattern. The medical examiner went out there after the remains had been removed, just, I assume, to look for more things, whether it was remains or pieces of evidence, because medical examiners take into account evidence as well as just the body. How on earth could anyone have missed this if the TikToker found it? Well, nothing really surprises me, obviously, with this case anymore, Ashley. And it wasn't just the medical examiner. I mean, we were out there. They were doing a grid search of that area. They had put uh, crime scene tape up all around near where the remains were. I mean, stretching out hundreds and hundreds of feet. And they told us they were searching that area for any kind of evidence, not just Brian Longy's remains, but anything. And I spoke to that TikToker. Her name is Olivia. And she says that water bottle was not far from the remains, maybe 100 feet 
eight or so. Um, she is a young woman who I have seen many times. She has been outside the house many times over the last several weeks. I've seen her at the reserve. She oftentimes is with her mother. Um, she has quite a TikTok following, more than a million, uh, a million followers. Mm -hmm. Um, so some people are saying, gosh, could she have planted it there just for attention? I mean, anything is possible, but I will say, you know, I don't know her well, but she's someone that I've come across almost every other day. Um, she called me when she found the bottle. Uh, she sent me that video. I told her, you know, you need to take it to the police station, which is what she did, and filed a police report. Um, and she insists that she just stumbled it ac across it there at the reserve. Well, they'll be able to do some analysis on it and hopefully get some prints, but, I mean, it would be pretty crappy if somebody decided to play around and get followers. I mean, that would be a terrible thing. I'm not saying she did that, but they'll, they'll hopefully have that as it's now part of the uh, investigation. I also don't think if, if she was planning it there, she would have turned it to, over to the police. I think that gets you in a whole lot of trouble because that's equivalent to making false statements, right? Well, yeah, and the other thing is, you know, before reporting this today, I wanted to be clear and talk to Northport Police. This all went down yesterday. I had the video. We waited till today and confirmed that Northport Police are taking it seriously. It's part of the investigation now. And obviously, if that bottle, that same bottle, was already in the van that they have, because if, if you saw the YouTube video, Ashley, that bottle had a special little place in Gabby's van. They almost had, like, a little compartment for it. Uh, we saw it in all of her old videos. You would imagine if the FBI Northport Police police already had the bottle, they would have very easily just told me today, look, like we already have that bottle. There's something fishy about this. That's not what they said at all. They said, yes, we've taken it in. It's now part of the investigation. So eerie just to see it there in, in, in better times. Okay, let's talk about your interview with Josh Taylor with the Northport Police. You got a whole lot of gems and we were going to unload all of them on Friday night and, and you know, Steve Bertolino, poof, you know, it was just the whole hour. So um, I want to play something that, that you got with regard to the notebook. Here's Brian's interview uh, with Josh Taylor regarding the, 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 the situation involving the notebook. Take a look. What is the status of the notebook? Uh, that's kind of outside of my purview here at the Norport Police Department. Certainly the FBI has that. They will utilize every tool that they have uh, to make sure that it's handled with care. Um, it was wet and uh, certainly making sure that's dried out and been able to go through will be very important. Do you know if is anything in it legible at this point? Do you know? I believe that there are some things that can be revealed from that. I'm, I'm not pervy to exactly what's in there. So Brian, the question I have is, um, when we learned that this, that this was salvageable potentially, and that the FBI didn't even want to crack that notebook open until it was dried, I thought, okay, well, by Monday, <laughs> it's not going to take more than two or three days to dry that notebook out. And I know they're really tight-lipped. Do they give us any information at all as to when they will actually be able to start forensically looking through the notebook for the secrets that hopefully, you know, will mean that they didn't go to Brian's grave? They did not give us a timeline, Ashley, and sort of what I understood from Northport Police and Josh Taylor were there was that they had eyes on the notebook. They were able to see that there was possibly something significant in it that could still be read, but that it was wet and that it is now in the hands of the FBI. So I think it's going to be up to the FBI to decide when they want to release uh, what's inside. Even though Brian Laundry is now dead, this is obviously still an ongoing investigation. So I suspect we won't hear what's in that notebook for, for quite some time. Well, I sure hope we will. I mean, it's frustrating given the fact that I think that the Gabby Petito case will likely be closed if this was the number one and only suspect and strong suspect, meaning no other suspects. If that case closes, then there's no reason to keep that stuff private. Um, part of the case. It's not just someone's private belongings. It's part of the case. Okay, so here's the other thing that, you know, we were going to talk about on Friday night. It was just such a big story. Holy moly, the police had eyes on um, the laundries from the front and the back, and it was streaming. There's just so many questions I, I have with regard to that, but I'm just going to let you take that and, and run with it, Brian. 
Yeah, so we discovered pretty early on, Ashley, that they had these hidden cameras around the laundry house. I would say a week into us being in Northport, so like five weeks ago, uh, I was talking to neighbors every day. They told me about the cameras. There was one behind the house uh, that I think you have video of that was in a neighbor's backyard pointed at the back of the laundry's house. There was another one in front of the house actually hidden in someone's um, dumpster. Uh, it was kind of an interesting side note when I first discovered one of the cameras. Like I was getting up real close and looking at it, um, and they were live streaming them back to the police station. Almost immediately, the neighbor comes running out with the police on the phone, saying, "Like they see you, they see you. Like they're they're telling you, you got to get out of the yard." So of course we did the right thing. We didn't tell anyone about these cameras until it was confirmed on Friday uh, that Brian Laundry was dead, and then we went public with the camera situation. Uh, some of the cameras, Ashley, were told were put up before. Or, uh, they believed that Brian Laundry went missing, which is a whole other story. Uh, and then there were some that were put up, like the one in the backyard, um, after the police said uh, that they no longer knew where Brian Laundry was. Well, let's start with the one that's in the front yard that would have been trained on the silver Mustang because that neighbor said it went up on the 12th and Brian didn't leave, according to everybody now, until the 13th. So the live stream of that silver Mustang backing out with Brian in it taking him to the reserve where he would die was being live streamed if the neighbor is, is telling us the, the, the right facts and dates. So I just want to play this soundbite if I can, because you put that to, to Josh Taylor. You know, you're much more articulate about it than I. I I'm just mad about it. I'm mad that that was just missed. But here's your question and his answer about that moment. Take a look. Our intention was to keep an eye on Brian and clearly him uh, going out there, uh, we missed him going out there. So he left in the Mustang and no one knew that he left in the Mustang? That's correct. I mean, isn't it, I mean, we've been outside the house, I mean, it, was there just no one sitting outside the house watching? I mean, did someone like fall asleep? Yeah. I mean, how do you, it's not like you snuck out the back if he left out in the front in the yeah. Mustang. Well, again, he, he wasn't wanted. You ha you, there's certain things you can do with surveillance and intelligence. When you're at a certain point in an investigation, when there are certain charges, where there's these types of things, um, you know, it just, uh, we weren't there at that point in the case. Okay, a couple things there, Brian. Uh, oh, I like that guy. He seems really nice. But on the, on the 12th, if they put the camera there, they put the camera for a reason, because they suspected something. Number two. Guy comes back to Florida with Gabby's van. Gabby's reported missing on the 11th. Gabby's not in van. Guy won't talk to police. Probable cause. Sorry, but that's probable cause. So they had every right to follow him. They had every right to follow that Mustang. They had a camera trained on it. So come on, there was a reason you wanted to see if that Mustang went anywhere or if anybody went out that front door. Uh, so I'm struggling with this one. And then you come to us today with something even more confounding, that when the Mustang came back a few days later, they thought that the person who got out was, was Brian, and it was not Brian Anton. Who was it? Yeah, so this even caught me off guard today. I had done that interview with Josh Taylor on Friday. I thought we'd sort of piece this together, and then he comes out with this today. Okay, follow me here. So you remember when the police chief said, we know where Brian Laundry is, we have eyes on Brian, and that turned out not to be true. Well, we've obviously been grilling Josh Taylor in person and behind the scenes, explain this to us, why did the chief think that he knew where Brian Laundry was, but he actually didn't. So today, Josh Taylor clarified it and said earlier that week, um, they saw the Mustang pull into the driveway on Wednesday of that week, that first week, and they saw someone get out with a ball cap on and go in the house, and they thought that was Brian Laundry. Well, it turns out it was Roberta Laundry. It was Brian's mom. They thought Roberta was Brian, so the officers doing the surveillance called up to the higher-ups and said, oh, we saw Brian go into the house, we've got eyes on Brian, but now they've realized it was actually Roberta. If I did that, I'd get fired as a journalist, you know, and the stakes, I mean, you know, no, the stakes are pretty low with, 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 with what we do when we watch people, but Roberta's in her maybe early 60s, late 50s. Uh, she wears like a flouncy thing a lot. She's kind of short. Uh, Brian's a tall, skinny, bald dude with a beard. I, I'm sorry. I just cannot 
I can't compute, Brian Enton. I just can't compute. I thought it was a typo. I, <laughs> when you sent that today, I thought it was a typo. All right, my friend, I know you're packing up and you're heading to Wyoming, and I know you're going to do incredible work when you're there. So we'll see you tomorrow night uh, with your report from... Uh, I don't know if you're even going to make it in time for tomorrow night. Okay, I'm just going to give you the day off tomorrow yeah. so that you can compile some good work. Brian, thank you. Thanks, Ashley. We'll see you later. Even when he has a weekend off, he still works. That's Brian Enton. And still to come, she makes a living picking through people's bones. So much so that she's the inspiration behind the award-winning show of the same name, Bones. Kathy Reichs, writer, producer, forensic skeleton doctor. She's here next with her theories on how Brian ended up dead. No matter how long Brian Laundrie's body was decomposing in that Florida swamp, there is still a story that it will tell. Because as it turns out, dead men do tell tales. It just takes a brilliant woman like Dr. Kathy Reichs to sort through the bones they leave behind and discover the forensic stories that are buried within. Dr. Reichs is the forensic anthropologist who inspired the hit TV show Bones. She wrote a series of novels about a forensic super savant named Temperance Brennan. And she's just released a brand new one, too, called The Bone Code. So man, oh man, is she ever perfect for this. Uh, Dr. Rex, thanks so much for, for being here. I, I keep thinking with just some skeletal remains and we don't even know how many, is there a chance that we will never find out um, how Brian Laundrie died? Absolutely. There are, a, one of the things that the anthropologists will look at is manner of death. They will look for any evidence of sharp instrument trauma. And I'm only talking hypothetically because I didn't work on this case, but uh, mm -hmm. I've worked on many similar to it. But they will be looking for sharp instrument trauma, stabbing, slashing. They will be looking for blunt instrument trauma. They will be looking, of course, for gunshot trauma. And those, of course, are going to give you some information about manner of death. There are many types of death that don't leave anything in the bones, poisoning, is not going to leave anything in the bones unless it's very long term and you know like arsenic or something um if your gut stabbed and you just bleed out that's not if it doesn't touch a bone then you're not going to derive anything from the skeleton see that's the big question i think because yeah, look if he shot himself the gun can't walk off on its own a dead body usually has a gun within falling distance and uh, that left me to think, well, if he if he hanged himself, then the, the cord would be around the, the you know, um, the top of the uh, spine. And that made me think, OK, well, what if he took pills or, or, or cut his wrists? You wouldn't necessarily see evidence of either. You mentioned the pills. You might not see evidence of that in the in the wrists either. Right. You might see evidence in the wrists. I have seen um, where you have very uh, hairline cuts from an, uh, if, uh, if there's a very sharp knife um, that can get all the way down to the bone. So you could see evidence of that. And the placement of those would be telltale. Do you think there's a shot at this point, Dr. Reichs, that there's any flesh at all left? Because we have no idea how much uh, they have found. They've called it skeletal. Um, and, and we don't know how long it was out there, but can skeletal remains have bits, little bits of flesh left behind that could let you know if it was an overdose? Abs well, there could be flesh left behind. Um, it could be, it, the body could go in one of two directions. One would be mummification, where you lay out a long time, but usually that's going to be in a dry environment, or it's going to go towards putrefaction, decomposition. But it's going to do that in a gradual progression so that there may be especially ligamentous the tough things that hold the, the bones together at the joints, the ligamentous tissue, you may find bits of that still clinging to the skeleton, even though it's, it's uh, far into decomposition. Also, we're deep in the joints or where it's protected by bone, where you've got flesh muscle that might have been protected by a bone. You may very well get bits of that. Now, whether you're going to be able to de derive any poison from that, I doubt it, because it would take time for that poison to have made its way metabolically through the system and to get out into into the bones or into the you know the periphery and so that's not likely 
Last question, Dr. Reichs, and that is this. Um, again, we don't know how many parts of Brian's skeleton they found, but most people have been talking about gators and wild boars. Not many people have been talking about the vultures, and you've got a little sort of secret about that. Well, yeah, I mean, birds are one of your biggest, any animal will scavenge anything. Rodents, your dog, your cat, bears, as you say, vultures, anything is going to scavenge. And that's probably going to show up on the bones or it's going to show up on the distribution of the bones because animals tend to drag things around or even, you know, fly away a little bit and drop it at some distance from, from the body. The other thing the anthropologist is probably going to be looking at is, uh, so dispersal patterns, important, you know, were the, was the skeleton just lying there as a complete skeleton or was it, I would suspect, distributed somewhat uh, from the primary location? And the other thing they're going to be looking at is what we call post-mortem interval time. Can we nail down, can that anthropologist, that team, uh, nail down time since death? When was the time of death? Um, not to within hours or anything like that, but by looking at the state of decomposition and knowing the environmental conditions. Um, I understand it was swampy, it was wet. You know, how long was it wet? Was it alternating wet and dry? What scavenging animals are there? What scavenging insects are present? The anthropologist is probably gonna work with an entomologist, a forensic entomologist, who's a bug, bug specialist, kind of how, like we had on, on bones, and a forensic botanist. And what, is there vegetation growth above the bones, above the belongings um, that were in the vicinity of the body? All of those things are gonna help in determining how, when uh, Brian Laundry died, because we don't know exactly when that took, took place. I mean, it's just so fascinating. Um, Kathy Reichs, thank you so much for your expertise and for your super smart writing. Uh, the brand new book is called The Bone Code, and it is available online and in major bookstores. Love her. Coming up, does the Laundry family's attorney have a privilege problem? And I'm not talking money here. Why Stephen Bertolino might have to share what Brian told him about Gabby Petito's death with the police and maybe even a judge. Why? That's next. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Brian Laundry investigation. Brian's parents, Chris and Roberta, have left their home for an undisclosed location. According to the family's attorney, Steve Bertolino, they are grieving privately. Mr. Bertolino was my guest on this show on Friday, and if you didn't see it, I think you should go to our website, check it out. It's quite lively. I think it was quite informative as well. It was supposed to be 20 minutes and it actually ended up being the entire hour. So now you really have to go and see it. Uh, but a particularly important part of the conversation happened when we discussed which conversations with the laundries fell under attorney-client privilege and more importantly, which conversations did not. Here is some of that discussion. I, I just mean for the purpose of this particular engagement, say from September 1st on, you did not go to Northport uh, to engage with them. You, you really had to do this from afar. That's correct. Uh, everything uh, has been, you know, by telephone, text message, or um, how should we say, uh, FaceTime. Or, or, or sort of these, these group Zooms? Did you have like the family, you know, group uh, FaceTime or the group Zoom like this? No, we didn't. We didn't do something like that. Conference calls? We've had a couple of conference calls, yes. Without divulging anything they said, were they at least all three of them, um, you know, able to engage with you and, uh, and fill you in on their perspectives of anything that you were discussing? On September 12th and September 13th, yes. Absolutely. And you did say on this program that you did have conversations both days with them all together as a family meeting. What did they tell you? Because that isn't privileged. I disagree. I think, you know, I, you can represent multiple clients, as you know. You can get waivers of representation, as you know. No, you so, can't. You can't have that conversation no. in criminal proceedings. And that, that does mean that the, the privilege is waived. You can do it in real estate. So I want to bring in a criminal defense attorney and a civil rights attorney, Mark O'Mara, who knows ugh, more than anyone could ever forget uh, based uh, on, on all of his practice on, on privilege. So Mark, if Stephen Bertolino had conference calls with mom, dad, and Brian, that's not privileged. 
No, uh, uh, the easy answer is no. And the reason why is if you think about it and ask you, if you don't mind, I'll use you as my client. If you and I are speaking about anything in the world having to do with you and your legal concerns, that is completely privileged. Nobody, not even a judge, can get to that. But if I bring in anybody, if I bring in your husband, your child, your spouse, your mom, your dad, a friend, anybody else, even, for example, a priest who has his or her own privilege with you, that violates or vitiates and simply does away with the privilege. And the reason makes sense, it is supposed to be a communication between one lawyer and one client. Now, what I think Mr. Bertolini was trying to say, and you just referenced, was, you know, are there those situations where you can have two clients, but they're both coming to you for the same legal advice? The answer is yes, if, they are, if their interests are completely aligned, uh, and literally in the same financial peril, I'm sorry, legal peril, then yes. But even in that case, it's particularly dangerous. I never represent co-defendants in a criminal case, for example, because it's not just what happens today, it's what might happen tomorrow. And I think your question pointed that exactly out, because there are divergent interests between the um, parents and Brian. And just to be real clear quickly, uh, there should be privilege between man and wife and lawyer, no? Well, yes and no. Don't forget that, that there are two separate privileges, mine with you, but you and your husband, that communication in order to be privileged between husband and wife has to be intended to be privileged. So the question is, can I lay two privileges on top of one another and maintain them both? That's unsettled law, and I would be very careful taking that on. Okay, would you also advise a, a lawyer to take on uh, three clients in the same family and represent all three, or is that something that represents conflict? It's, it's just so dangerous, it's fraught with problems, because as soon as one of those three people say, wait a minute, you said this, or wait a minute, my interest is slightly different than yours now, then there is no privilege, the conflict is enormous, which is why we as lawyers are not supposed to even get anywhere near the appearance of impropriety or conflict, which is why there's more than one lawyer. Go get two other lawyers to represent them individually and you maintain the privilege. That's expensive. Okay, so then the next question I asked is, when did you start representing the laundries? And he said September 11th. But doesn't that mean if he's holding himself out as the representative, being having been ret um, retained on the 11th, that everything between the 1st and the 11th is fair game, because that's when Brian came home. And clearly they weren't talking to the Petitos for a reason. They must have been told, don't do it. Well, and again, it would seem as though they had some advice between those two dates. And I don't want to, to impugn Mr. Bertolini's integrity at all, but there's this concept in law we know from the movies called, you know, consigliere, you know, where you just, you're there to help whatever questions need to be answered. But in that same analogy, you have less of a concern with the law, less of a concern with the facts, and certainly less concern with your ethical obligations than you do with, you know, the protecting the family, not to make fun of it. But, and that is dangerous for a real lawyer to do. Yeah, I'm still super interested in, in all the conversations that happened between the 1st and, and the 11th. If, if you weren't retained, you weren't officially counsel, well, tell me what happened. And if you don't want to tell me, I get it. I'm the press. But you're going to have to tell the police if they, uh, if they ask. Okay, Mark, since I have you, I know you probably thought it was time to go get a nice, you know, drink before bed. Oh, but um, love talking. I have another story. Okay, so don't go anywhere because then there's this whole story about Alec Baldwin. Like, there's no question Alec Baldwin's grieving the loss of his cinematographer, but there may be another dust up on the horizon for him. So could that Emmy-winning actor face jail time? for his role in that deadly shooting. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Welcome back. Between the nonstop drama of the laundry search and the brand new shock of the movie Death, police in South Carolina released a couple of things, some 911 recordings of the Murdoch mess, and you really do need to hear them. But first I wanna bring back my lawyers, Mark O'Mara and Mark Garagos. Okay guys, I'm gonna start with the first one, and this is Alex Murdoch's call to 911, ostensibly while he's bleeding on the side of the road. Uh, have a listen. I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me. And when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay. Were you shot? Yes. But I mean, I'm okay. 
I'm okay. And then his lawyer said superficial wounds, bullet wounds, posterior scalp, skull fracture, brain bleeding, and, and then life flight. To the <laughs> life flight. So then what followed is a 911 call, guys, uh, from a witness who was driving by. Now, this one I thought was going to be super uh, excited. And, and then I heard this. Take a listen. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Yes, um, we're on Sakahatchee Road, and uh -huh. there is a man on the side of the road with blood all over him, and he's waving his hands. He just laying there, fleet, weaving his hands around? Fine. He looks fine, but it kind of looks like a setup, so we didn't stop. Oh, I don't blame you. So it looked like a setup. Um, oh. Cheapers, creepers. Okay, so Mark O'Mara, I mean, are they just going to skip right ahead to the next case and just write this one off? I mean, how do you get beyond that stuff? I, I, it just seems like such a poorly worded or, or written novel. It just gets worse every yeah. time you hear another piece of evidence about it. But here's a lady just happened to be driving by and catches the absolute truth of this case, which is it was a setup. Right? We now know it was a setup. And here's a lady driving by who finds it. And then you have Murdoch himself, who's like, well, a guy tried to shoot me. And oh, yeah, he did shoot me. And I'm okay. And it's just, you, wait a minute, you were the one who set this guy up for a bunch of money to kill you. I, I just, it doesn't get much more absurd than this, but I guess right. we're not done yet. I'm, there will be more absurdity, I promise you that. <laughs> And I'm going to give it to you right now. It's the rest of Alec Murdoch on the 911 call. And this is how a guy who is supposed to, like, he's trying to let people believe that he's almost just been murdered, right? It was an attempted murder. And, and that this is, what, this is what he said in terms of the description of the, the fella who shot him. It was uh, okay. right. uh, so a white fella. Uh, I'd say younger a white male. Uh -huh. A fair amount younger than me. Uh, really, really short hair. Okay, so Mark Aragos, I can only think now that he is trying to come up with some scheme in his head that's going to get Cousin Eddie off the hook, because that's not a description of Cousin Eddie, and clearly this whole scheme didn't work, so now he's, like, cleaning it all up best he can. I think the uh, easiest thing that you could come to the conclusion is you're generally, if it goes to trial, you're not putting him on the stand. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. Sorry. Is it? You think this is going to go to trial? Could you imagine this at trial? And I've got only like 30 seconds left. Well, let, let me just tell you one thing. I suspect that there's a lot more to this story, driving this story, and I'll leave it at that. I just think that uh, the, you may see a trial out of this. I'd be fascinated. So um, well, you know, Mark O'Mara, I want to talk. Can you come back again? We're going to do the story again, of course, because Absolutely. I do think there's going to be, I think there's going to be more than one trial. I think we may even have something that's connected to the death of his wife and son. So uh, Mark O'Mara and Mark Aragos, thank you both. I adore having Thanks. you. You're the best. Be well. Thanks, guys. Coming up tomorrow, I needed to tell you something. Um, so this is amazing. While all of this laundry business has been going on in Northport, there are tourists who have come to see the crime scene, to see all the sites. And we're gonna take you site by site with some of these crime tourists who met on Facebook, came together for the story. That's tomorrow.